Hi there everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm the GCSE science teacher. In today's video, we are going to be learning about amino acids and this is specifically aimed for students who are studying the triple science or higher combined course. And essentially this is part of the course which kind of links on nicely to those higher tier topics. And especially if you're looking to do A-level chemistry as well. So these are some of the key ideas that kind of overlap into those areas, but also there is some connection with biology GCSE as well. So I hope you find this video helpful. If you do, please please give it a big thumbs up so I know, share it with someone else so they don't miss any key information and also feel free to subscribe and join our community. We're almost at 100 subscribers here and it would be lovely for you to join us, so please do. Thank you so much for your support, let's get started. So first of all, amino acids, what actually are they? Well, they're molecules with two functional groups that you need to be able to recognize. So the first functional group, as you can see, is an NH2 group and this is often called an amino group and it's highlighted in blue here. The other functional group is the carboxylic acid group, and we did cover this in a previous lesson, so I will link that for you in the cards or in the description box or somewhere at the end for you if you missed it. But essentially, a carboxylic acid group is slightly different to the amino group because it has a carbon, two oxygens, and a hydrogen, and you can see that the oxygen is bonded to the carbon with a double bond. All of these um, bonds that you see are covalent bonds because all of these atoms are not metals. So just be careful if you ever get asked about the types of bonds that you see. Also, an amino acid has a variable region, often called an R region or an R group. And you can see that essentially what it means is that there is a whole host of different things the R group could be. Um, it just depends on the type of amino acid. So the R group changes every time, depending on what kind of amino acid it is. Interestingly enough, there's roughly 500 different types of amino acids that have been identified in nature, but around 20 of those are essential to the human body. And we actually can see that amino acids, when they bond together and chemically react together, they actually form long structures called polypeptides or proteins. And depending on the different amino acids that join together will depend on the types of proteins that are made. Remember, proteins are found all over the place in the human body, including things like structural proteins, so collagen, for example. We also have proteins in the form of hormones, so insulin and estrogen and other hormones as well, part of the endocrine system. We also have other proteins that kind of have more of a functional role. So hemoglobin, which is found in red blood cells, and this carries oxygen around the body. There's loads and loads of different examples of, of different proteins that are found within the human body. And it's worth just being aware that um, they're made up of amino acids. And we are going to talk about how those amino acids respond and react together in the next little bit of time. So what actually happens when amino acids join together chemically? Well, we have something called a condensation polymerization reaction. And this just means the amino acids chemically combine to form long chains. And those long chains are either polypeptides and proteins. Remember, amino acids are essentially the small subunit. So we refer to it as a monomer. And when we connect lots of monomers together, we call these polymers. So the polymer of an amino acid would be a protein or a polypeptide. Um, depending on the type of amino acid, like a said will also determine the type of protein that forms and the structure of it and therefore its function as well. Remember some proteins even include enzymes so the structure of it can be vital for its function because enzymes for example have an active site and that really does kind of make a huge difference in its functionality. The same is can be said for things like um, antibodies okay those are proteins too and they have a very specific shape to allow them to function the way they do. So essentially this type of reaction is really fundamental to life as well. So let's talk about condensation polymerization. Let's actually break this down so it makes a bit more sense. First of all, the first word is condensation. In any condensation reaction, water is formed. And you can see that here we have a H2O molecule. Condensation in its own definition just means water. If you think about condensation on a window, that's when water vapor cools down and condenses into a liquid again, so it's no longer a gas. And that is kind of a way to kind of recall this information. Polymerization, again, is to make polymers, to make a larger structure from a smaller subunit. So that hopefully helps you identify these terms. So when we talk about condensation polymerization, we need to kind of know how this particular 
um, chemical reaction occurs. So we can see we've got our first um, monomer, our first amino acid here, and we have an N which is next to it. The N just means a number. So we could have 10 lots of that amino acid condensing together, or we could have 20 or 30 or 100. And the N just represents any number at all. When they bond together, we actually want to use brackets to demonstrate that this is a repeated unit. So as you can see in the diagram, the water molecule has been removed, but square brackets are used and the um, the lines that go over the square brackets, those are the um, bonds that are formed between the individual monomers. And essentially, instead of having to draw the whole thing out, which would take up lots of space and again, lots of time, scientists have been more efficient in the fact they've just drawn one monomer and they've put a bracket around it to represent that this is a repeated unit over time. It just saves time. It's kind of like the periodic table where you have a symbol instead of writing out the whole word. It just makes it more universally understood by everyone. Um, something to mention at this point as well that um, I know I've got a picture of some T-shirts and material there and polyester. Polyester is actually an example of a condensation polymer and it's worth being aware of that key example as well. And that's it from me today. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please feel free to give it a thumbs up, share it with someone else and do subscribe. Like I said, we are so close to hitting 100 subscribers here on YouTube, which is amazing. And what a wonderful goal that would be. So thank you so much for all your support. I do appreciate it. It's really great that you're here. So thank you. If you would like some more help with biology, chemistry or physics GCSE, feel free to check out my channel. I have listed some for you, which you can click on now. Also my Instagram and TikTok has loads of resources too. So if you would like is at the GCSE science teacher. I know how close your exams are if you're a year 11 student. So best of luck for your revision. And if you have any questions or particular topics you'd like me to cover before the exam, feel free to let me know in the comments section. I am planning on having a uh, kind of condensed notes video where I go through some of the key topics for paper one, as I know biology is coming up very shortly. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, do let me know in the comment section too. In the meantime, have a fantastic day and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.